Hey there, everybody. We're back for another episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. This time it's episode 89. And today we're going to talk about martial arts weapons, one of my favorite subjects. Now, I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, but I'm better known as your host, Jeremy Lesniak. Whistlekick, if you don't know, makes the world's best sparring gear and excellent apparel and accessories for practitioners and fans of traditional martial arts. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank all of you that are listening again. If you're not familiar with our products, you can learn more or buy over at whistlekick.com. All of our past podcast episodes, show notes, and a lot more are on a different site, and that's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. From either site, you can sign up for our newsletter, and you really should. We offer exclusive content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests to the show. We've got a great iTunes review to share with you, and this one comes in from Pistol975. It's a five-star review, which we always love. And it says, actually it's titled, Great Show. Jeremy has put a wonderful show together here. The wisdom and insight given in this show is top-notch and entertaining. If you're an experienced martial artist, someone looking to get involved, or anywhere in between, I highly recommend this show. Thanks, Jeremy. Pete. Well, thank you, Pete. Really appreciate you spending the time to leave that for us. Of course, the show is a lot bigger than just myself. I do put in a lot of the time on the back end, but we've got the guests, we've got people that help with some scheduling in there. I mean, there's a, there's a lot going on in this mix. And of course, the feedback that we receive from all of you and the show ideas and all that really honestly could not do it without all of you. Uh, to paraphrase one of our, our guests on the show, um, without all of you, I would just be a crazy guy talking into, into a microphone and maybe that's all I am but you're all listening so what does that say about you <laughs> anyway moving on Pete go ahead shoot us a message and we'll get you your free pack of whistle kick stuff really appreciate that and to the rest of you that have left reviews thank you keep them coming they're really helping us out so let's jump into it let's talk about martial arts weapons let's start talking about the history of course now, it doesn't take a big stretch of the imagination to th realize that weapons are probably just about as old as fighting. You know, if you're in an altercation with someone and you're a caveman and there's a rock, you know, you're you're probably going to want to one up the guy. You probably want to hit it, going to hit him with a rock or a stick, right? That's that's pretty obvious. But the oldest surviving weapons are this set of eight spears that archaeologists found. And those go back 300,000 years. So pretty cool stuff there. Of course, the most popular martial arts weapons history really centers around Okinawa. And this was a story that was told to me many, many times during my early martial arts career. And the saying the story went that on Okinawa, and I went off Japan for those of you that don't know, weapons were illegal there. So the common people, the Okinawans, developed their weapons and their weapons practices from their farm implements. And it's a great story, and it really kind of embodies the martial spirit, and I love it. The only problem is that there's absolutely no historical evidence supporting it. Uh, yes, weapons were illegal, but there's no real proof that the weapon systems that were developed on Okinawa came directly from farm implements. There is quite a few uh, documents showing that those weapons came over from China. And the weapon systems weren't really practiced by the commoners on Okinawa, but actually more the warrior class. And some scholars have said that the the weapons-based forms from Okinawa may actually predate karate, the, the, the unarmed systems from Okinawa. And so that's kind of being debated a little bit uh, on the academic side, but kind of interesting to think that weapons could be that much of its own component of the martial arts that it comes before the empty hand stuff, at least in this region. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the relationship between weapons arts and unarmed arts as we move forward. 
Of course, when we start to think about weapons as a broad component of the martial arts, and we start adding in things like swords, there's a ton that we can talk about. And we're not going to go into depth about all of the different origins of the different weapons arts across the globe, because we'd be here all day, right? Could turn this into a Ken Burns documentary. For those of you that don't know who Ken Burns is, uh, go look him up. Of course, there are sword styles that originated in China, Japan, Korea, medieval Europe, ancient Europe, you know, the Greeks, the Romans, they all had swords. The ancient Indian art of Kalaripayatu, if I'm saying that anywhere close to right, they had bladed weapons. Uh, we've talked about that a little bit, I think, in social media, not so much on the show, as possibly being the original martial art, uh, the one that was brought by the Bodhidharma to the Chinese temples that everything else that we think of as the original martial arts stemmed from. But even as far back as the ancient Indian practice of Kala Ripayatu, they had bladed weapons. Now, the first Japanese swords were made of iron, and they came from techniques that the Chinese developed and brought through Korea. That was sometime in the fourth century or so. But the katana, you know, with that distinctive curved blade, when we think about Japanese swords, we tend to think of the katana in that shape. That was years later that that developed, somewhere between 800 and 1200. The shinai, that great bamboo practice sword that some of us uh, have experienced across the back of our legs. Uh, I know I have. Uh, that actually wasn't developed until the 1800s. Now, we really can't talk about Japanese swordsmanship and Japanese swordsmanship history without mentioning Miyamoto Musashi, who was the author of the Book of the Five Rings, and he lived sometime in the 1600s, late 1500s, early 1600s, if we want to be really specific there. Now, Korean swordsmanship, that's kind of at an interesting place right now. You've got some people that are reconstructing this sort of lost knowledge there, there are books, photos, uh, some things that have been discovered fairly recently or, or just kind of archives that are getting pulled back out. While well, you have others that are practicing sort of Korean versions of Japanese sword arts like kendo. And at least as far as Korea goes, evidence of sword practice goes all the way back to the fourth century, you know, kind of ties in with as iron swords were traveling from China through Korea to Japan. But the earliest evidence of regimented, systematized sword training in Korea goes back to the 12th century. And part of the reason, perhaps the main reason that Korean sword training really faded out was because in the late 1800s, Japan had a really strong cultural influence and Japan was focusing a lot more on firearms. So there was a big shift there in the military to uh, focus more on guns. Swords, of course, go back a lot further than the 4th century. The first swords in Egypt were made of bronze, and they go back more than 4,000 years. So there's a lot going on back there. We don't have a ton of records of how they were used or anything, so I'm not going to spend any real time digging into that. Of course, if we think about the types of weapons, you know, Okinawan weapons have a a fairly small set that we talk about. You've got the bow, the staff, uh, the sai, tunfa, nunchaku. Uh, just personal aside, uh, please don't call them numb chucks. Uh, drives me crazy. Uh, kama, teko, which is basically brass knuckles. Uh, Timbe Russian, shield and a spear. Surujin, which is kind of a weighted chain or a cord. The eku, uh, which is an oar. Tambo, which is a short staff about the length of the forearm, sometimes used in pairs. Uh, kua, which is really a gardening hoe. The hanbo, which is a shorter staff about the length of the leg. Nuntibo, which is kind of a staff with a sai on the end. And sensetsukan, which is a three-sectional staff. Think of like a nunchaku, but with an extra wooden piece and an extra piece of rope. And that's that's pretty much it. I mean, there, there may be some others. Again, you know, we've got this question of where all these weapons came from. So 
different Okinawan martial arts have different weapons that they use, uh, different sets, I guess is probably a better way to put it. But those are kind of the core accepted ones. Now, Indian weapons, mentioned those before. They had a lot more in the way of blades, different lengths, different shapes for different purposes. But, you know, a blade is a blade, right? So even though the shapes were different, they were all designed to either slice or stab. Chinese martial arts weapons, of course, is a, a much longer list. You've got a bigger geographic area, people doing things differently, and potentially, depending on how you want to interpret history, for a longer period of time. Most of them are similar to at least something on that list of Okinawan weapons that I mentioned. But then you have some other things that are completely different, like uh, Shuangao. Uh, the hook swords. Those are completely different. There's nothing in Okinawan or from what I've read, Japanese martial history that is anything similar. If you've never seen these, we've got some video up on the show notes page, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And they are swords that literally have hooks on the end. And they're really cool. I've seen people work with them in competitions, a lot of fun, something I'd love to play with myself someday. In some martial arts schools, weapons are taught in parallel. So my original martial arts upbringing, we started working with the bow, the staff, uh, usually around yellow belt. And in some schools, that's, that's how they do it. You know, it's part of the core curriculum and you have to learn certain weapons to progress to certain ranks. In other schools, it's optional. Some, it's completely separate, and they award separate rank for weapons training because it's a different skill set, treated almost as a different martial art entirely. In our niece, students typically learn the stick and knife techniques before they learn any empty hand techniques, and that's the opposite of what most martial arts styles do. Most of you that are listening, if you've learned martial arts weapons, You've learned them as an extension of your body. That's what most martial arts systems teach. You take the, the empty hand techniques, you put a weapon in your hands, and you adapt what you're doing, and it just gives you a better understanding of how to manipulate the weapon. European swordsmanship is kind of receiving this uh, renaissance, um, which uh, maybe is an ironic choice of words and not one that I intended. Uh, and we talked a little bit about that history on episode 78 with Sir Gemini Asante. And personally, I just, I find that era of martial arts history really fascinating because I don't know anything about it. But when we think about weapons, if we think about swords, of course, you know, that's one of the eras where sword work was, if not at the highest skill level, it was at least so deeply rooted in the culture that it survived today. Even a movie like Shrek, there are knights and they have swords, or you know, there are Lego sets that have swords and shields from that era. So I just find that really neat. And I think it's cool that we're starting to see more of that come into the broader martial arts realm. I think that most of us that train in the martial arts, even the most skilled, unarmed, martial artists would probably take the advantage of having a weapon in a fight if that opportunity arose. Because weapons give you an advantage. And at least in the way that we define weapons in martial arts, there's something all around you. I bet within your reach right now, there's something that you could use as a weapon. Most often it's something that you could use in place of a knife or a staff or a stick. And that's why these are usually the first weapons in most martial arts systems, because you can adapt just about anything to those techniques. One of the things that I really like about weapons training is that I think it gives us a different perspective. I think it broadens our context as martial artists the better that we understand weapons, how to attack with them, how to defend with them, how to attack someone that has one and defend against someone that has one, I think it makes us better overall. I think it 
gives us a better understanding of how the body moves, how people react, the advantages and disadvantages of having a weapon. Of course, just having a weapon in your hand doesn't automatically give you an advantage. And there's no better example that I can offer you, at least in audio, than if you've never done self-defense against someone with a bat or a, a long stick. Uh, what's job number one is to get inside the end range of that weapon. Because once you're inside, you know, just as if you're working with someone who is primarily a kicker, once you're inside the range of their foot, you know, they're not nearly as dangerous. And of course, if the person is focusing on the weapon or focusing on their kick, if we're going to stay with that parallel, you actually have an advantage. The world seems like it might be shifting into this kind of uh, increasingly dangerous place. And I don't, I don't want to debate that, but let's assume for a moment that it is. Now, some of us carry firearms, but some of us are unwilling or unable to in our day-to-day -day lives. So, of course, learning skills that you can apply in a situation to give you that advantage that a weapon inherently gives you can be really important and very effective. Getting better with a, a knife or a small stick, something like a kubaton, that can be really valuable. And of course, you figure they're all over the place. You know, learning how to handle that, it's a pretty good idea. Fun fact about the kubaton, it's not the ancient weapon that a lot of people automatically assume it was. It was invented back in the 1960s and it was really popularized when the Los Angeles Police Department started training female officers in how to use it. And if you're not familiar with what a kubaton is, it's basically a four to six inch long stick that often has a keychain. Some martial artists specialize in the training and teaching of these smaller weapons. And I would encourage a lot of you that feel like this is an appropriate path for your training to seek out someone like that. Of course, Guru Chris Thompson from episode 88. We recorded that episode not too long ago. It aired just a couple of days ago when we're recording this. He's a great example of that. He's an amazing martial artist overall, but especially with knives and sticks. Personally, I think weapons are just a lot of fun to train with. There's nothing that I can do outside of weapons to change the effective range of my attacks, of my kicks and my punches. I can't make my legs shorter or longer, but I can pick up a small knife or a long spear, and that can really give you a different perspective, as I mentioned before, on how combat can occur and how you can steer things to your advantage. If you've never trained with weapons, I really think you should, even, even just to play around. If you don't have a training partner or an instructor or a great place to train, just pick up a stick. And I don't mean go buy some fancy rattan thing off the internet. Just go out in your yard, out in the woods, pick up a stick and consider how you might use it in a way that takes the concepts from your unarmed training and adapts it. I am absolutely not a proponent of learning martial arts from videos. I'm not saying go spend 12 minutes on YouTube and call yourself a master stick fighter. But if you're just interested in understanding some of the core concepts, there's really a lot of great material out there that you can look up. Now, if you do find that weapons training is something that you want to bring into your own personal curriculum, I'll bet there's somebody nearby, every one of you out there, that knows enough about weapons to help you out, to at least get you started. And you really should seek that person out. Besides, I don't think weapons training is ever more fun than when you get to spar. And you have to find some training partners to do that. So go find some. What are your experiences with martial arts weapons? Do you train with them? If not, why not? If you do, why? How does it relate to your unarmed training? What's your favorite weapon? Whatever the comments, shoot us a message. 
You can get to us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. Or you can leave us a comment on our website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Or you can find the video over on YouTube. Just search Whistlekick. The show will come up. And if you think that this would be a great episode to share with one of your friends, please go ahead and do that. Help us spread the word. The show continues to grow. And that's thanks mostly to people like you that are helping us spread the word. So we really appreciate that. Now, if you want to be a guest on the show, or maybe you know someone that would be a great interview, perhaps you have an idea for a topic for one of our Thursday shows like this, go ahead, get a hold of us. There are forums on the website, or just shoot us an email, info at whistlekick.com. Don't forget to leave us a review. And if you're not, please subscribe to the newsletter. Stay subscribed to the show with one of the apps available on iOS and Android. You can learn more about the products we make at whistlekick.com. And our sparring gear is also available on Amazon. That's it for today. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Oh, but one more thing. Of course, we've got the Martial Arts Weekend coming up pretty soon, martialartsweekend.com, July 8th, 9th, and 10th. We talked today a lot about weapons. We are going to have some weapons training there. We've got some people bringing in some kind of European concepts. And uh, we've got Guru Chris, uh, who's going to be working some, some stick and some knife stuff with us. So again, it's, it's fleshing out to be an amazing weekend. Don't miss out. MartialArtsWeekend.com. Space is limited. We do have some spots left. Sign up right away. Don't miss out. Now we're done. Thanks. <laughs>